All right, we are going to get started. You guys, any questions from the uh, first half there? All right, so we're going into unit three. This is where we actually get into the nitty gritty of the pharmacokinetics. So we get into all the details uh, of this stuff. Um, can you guys hear me still? Everything good? Okay. All right, so again, kinetics, this is the effect that the body has on the drug. So it gets broken down into the A, D, M, and E. Or absorption, distribution, metabolism, and elimination. Okay, some of the other things we'll cover today include things like loading doses, steady state, this is a good concept to remember, and then toxicity as well, how that can uh, come about from uh, kinetics. So um, we're also going to look at things like interpreting volume distribution, right, which is going to be an important concept to look at uh, kind of where the drug goes within the body, and we'll talk about some of the major pathways for uh, metabolism and excretion as well. Okay, so again, going through kinetics of absorption, elimination, we'll cover. Okay, so again, kinetics here, right? So again, four key components are absorption, distribution, metabolism, excretion, right? So when I give the drug dose, again, it has to get liberated and then, uh, you know, whether it be in a tablet that I'm dissolving in the stomach that gets absorbed, whether it be an IV a fluid that I'm administering directly into the veins, whatever it has to be, it has to get into the system somehow. And so that's what we're gonna call absorption. At that point, it's going to be able to partition out into the tissues, essentially. And then some drugs do a lot of partitioning. Some drugs do a little bit of partitioning. And again, we'll look at distribution, how the drug properties can affect that. Um, and then, uh, you know, no drug sticks around in the body forever. So again, there's always going to be some degree of metabolism, generally. And then uh, finally, to get rid of the body, and then we're going to be excreting it out. Now, where do I excrete drugs out, typically? Usually in the urine. What are some other places? Anyone know? Feces, yep, so sometimes you'll find that the biliary tract is important for eliminating drugs out into the GI tract, and then that can be eliminated in the feces. Those are two main components. You might find some other places, but that's the main uh, sites we're going to see there. Other big things here to notice is, um, you know, there are proteins circulating within the bloodstream. There's things like albumin is a big one, um, alpha-1 acid glycoproteins, another big one. Um, when these bind drugs, and again, every drug has a different affinity to binding these uh, proteins here, um, these are not active drugs. Once they're bound to the proteins, they need to um, be dissociated from that protein in order to either go into the tissue or to interact with whatever receptors are going to be interacting with, right? So again, we talk about free drug. We're going to be talking about that as being the component of the drug that's not bound to those proteins. It's one concept to remember there. Um, and then, of course, there's you know there's tissue proteins as well, as you might imagine. And then you can have drug actually bind out there in the tissues as well. All this is going to play a role when getting into things like distribution uh, of the medications. But anyway, so these are the main components we're going to talk about. Um, so let's get into the actual details of how, the, how this all works. First one being absorption. So how do we get the drug into the body in the so again, we talked about um, things like permeation. We talked about things like uh, aqueous diffusion. We know these are, these are passive processes. Normally, they're going from areas of high concentration to areas of low concentration, right? So again, most of the time, you're going to find the drug absorption occurring, unless it's like you're putting it directly into the veins yourself, um, usually going to be occurring due to this uh, kind of passive diffusion. It's one of the most common ways, because again, we're giving a big bolus dose of the drug. It's a high concentration wherever you're administering it, and then it can then partition out across the tissues. So um, we're going to find that, again, aqueous diffusion is going to be passive, good for very um, for some, some drugs. We'll talk about different characteristics that can influence this. But um, lipid diffusion is going to be a big thing, because why do we care about lipid diffusion? Because drugs have to get across the cell wall, right? They have to get across that, these, these phospholipid bilayers. And so in order to do that, they need to be lipophilic, remember? Because usually those uh, uh, lipid bilayers keep things that are hydrophilic out, right? Because we want to keep certain uh, con contents out. We want to keep the cell contents in, essentially. So again, lipid solubility is going to be a big uh, determinant of how well drugs are going to be able to cross these membranes here. And one way you can actually affect how lipid soluble some of these drugs are going to be is by affecting the pH. So again, big concept I wanted to try to drill down into right now is going to be that like dissolves like, okay? I'll show you why that is in just a few minutes here. Um, anyone remember the Henderson-Hasselbalch equation? Anyone have nightmares of that still? Okay, we're going to talk about it briefly here, but just in, in the concept of how it's going to help us out to determine how well drugs are going to cross here. So um, there's also carrier-mediated uh, types of diffusion. Again, these are going to be good for things that cannot cross these membranes on their own. Sometimes you're going to find there's going to be transport proteins that will allow this to occur. Sometimes you have um, some active transporting uh, uh, proteins that are going to help to put drugs across the membrane. It all just depends. Um, in some cases, if they're active processes, if they're using ATP, then it's going to be typically going against the concentration gradient, right? Otherwise, if they have like you know things like glucose that have those glucose transporters, that can just be a type of facilitated diffusion that doesn't require any energy. Still going from areas of high to low concentration. 
Okay, so again, aqueous diffusion usually is going to be occurring um, with larger kind of aqueous components of the body. Think about like the blood or the, um, you know, the extracellular fluid, the kind of interstitial fluid there. Um, basically, what you're going to be finding is that um, the blood vessels on the endothelial lining there, there is going to be some aqueous pores that will allow for certain things to, to cross over, right? And so if I ever, you ever hear me talk about things like leaky capillaries or leaky blood vessels, this is kind of where you can find that these pores can actually change in size over time, especially like during cases of inflammation. You may find they tend to become extra leaky. Um, so Especially like you know if you think like sepsis and SIRS and things like that a really high inflammatory sort of states that, that can happen there but the law we're going to use to describe how well things are going to cross via aqueous diffusion is going to be called fixed law so fixed law and again don't get scared you don't have to calculate anything from this component at least um, but just know what the different variables are meaning here and again conceptually you're going to be able to kind of intuit how, how this is all working but um, and again, this kind of can work for kind of passive lipid diffusion as well. So keep these con uh, these different uh, factors in mind. So one thing is going to be, what's the concentration gradient, right? So what's the difference between the concentration on the outside of the membrane to the concentration across the membrane, essentially, right? So you have C1 and C2. Usually C1 is going to be the higher concentration. Otherwise, you'd see that the flow would happen backwards. So C1 is usually going to be the higher concentration there. Um, you're going to find that the area is going to be basically the area that the diffusion is actually occurring on. And this is actually becomes uh, important when you're talking about things like transdermal drug absorption. So again, imagine if I have a larger patch of skin that I'm trying to cover, I'm going to have a higher area. I'm going to have more drug diffusion that can occur there versus if I have a very small patch of skin I'm using or a very small area of membrane I'm trying to cross that can decrease the amount of flux I'm going to be having there, right? Because again, this all comes into flux, how much the drug is actually crossing over. Okay, so uh, higher concentration gradient, the bigger this is, the more flux I have. The bigger the area, the more flux I have. Everyone with me so far? Right? Um, and then permeability coefficient, this is basically telling me how easy it is usually how lipophilic the drug happens to be in order to cross that membrane itself, right? So again, um, the higher the permeability coefficient, the higher likelihood it's going to be able to cross over on its own and that increase flux as well. The one thing to note here is in the denominator here, you notice thickness. So again, thickness is going to be kind of inversely proportional um, to, to flux here, where the larger, the kind of the thicker the membrane I'm dealing with, the less flux I'm going to have, okay? That's important because that can actually affect how well drugs get absorbed in some cases. And I'll give you a clinical example here in just a minute. Um, but usually the thinner the skin or the thinner the membrane I'm trying to cross, the more flux I'm actually going to have here, right? So a uh, good example of this. So imagine like, you know, uh, an adult patient, uh, their epidermis is usually pretty well developed, right? So again, usually it's going to be a lot thicker than if you were, say, dealing with uh, an infant, right? So say you're dealing with like an eight-month-old patient, um, their skin is typically a lot thinner and it's going to be less well developed, okay? So I had this one case uh, that occurred where we had a, an eight-month-old patient, and basically the dad had some like chronic pain issues uh, that were that were happening. He was using a specially compounded cream he was getting from a pharmacy. It basically, had all kinds of mixture of different drugs in it. Um, some of which um, usually you wouldn't think about being absorbed super well, but um, he, he was applying it to his lower back for his lower back pain. Right. So. Being at home, uh, you know, accidents happen. And so mom was uh, taking the baby out of the bath, you know, a nice hot bath, uh, was, you know, getting them ready for a diaper change. Baby had a lot of diaper rashes going on anyway. And what does diaper rash skin kind of look like? Red, erythematous, got a lot of blood flow going to it. And we know that baby's, thin, uh, skin t baby's skin is usually a lot thinner than an adult. So basically mom screwed up. Instead of grabbing the diaper rash cream, she grabbed dad's chronic pain cream, right? So grab that stuff, apply it, slather it on, um, put on an occlusive, uh, diaper, right? We're going to find that uh, making things more occlusive tends to increase absorption, but basically put a diaper on and then put the baby to bed. Next morning they go and the baby is not breathing. They're like, oh my gosh, what's going on? So what they found was is that um, when they finally got the baby in, they were able to resuscitate the baby, got him intubated. Baby did fine at the very end, so no, no worries about the baby. But uh, what they found was they could actually measure detectable levels of the drug in the baby's system. Because that skin was much thinner for the baby than it was for the adult, they had a lot higher flux, right? So again, thickness here, the thinner the skin, the more flux you're actually going to have, the more ability for that drug to actually cross over. Does that make sense? What's happening there? Talk about that again in derm later on, but that's a big key component where you may find that uh, kids actually get better absorption of these uh, substances than, than adults will. Okay, so again, larger concentration gradients, the faster the diffusion, faster the absorption is going to be. Um, drug absorption usually is usually going to happen uh, faster with areas of large surface area. So this is why the intestines are so good at absorbing things, especially the small intestine. Remember those microvilli I was talking about that kind of line the inner um, uh, small intestine? That's great for absorbing drugs because the surface area is absolutely huge, right? Um, much more so than if you're dealing with, like, say, the stomach has a relatively small amount of absorbing area. Um, you see less drug absorption happening there. Okay. Um, drug absorption is going to happen faster uh, with organs with thin membranes. Imagine like the lungs, a lot thinner, a lot more uh, vascular. They're going to be able to absorb things better than something like, you know, a very well-developed skin uh, might.
And then, um, again, the body's way to try to establish steady state of this drug. And when I say steady state, I'm going to kind of go into this when we talk about metabolism. But basically, um, you know, uh, these are the kind of key components that kind of dictate how well drugs are going to cross kind of on their own via this uh, kind of passive diffusion. Again, here's a nice pictorial example kind of showing you, again, the bigger the surface area, more flux. The bigger the... Um, uh, the permeability coefficient or the bigger the concentration gradient, the more flux you're going to have. And then thickness is going to be inversely proportional there. So the thinner the membrane, the more flux I have. Okay. Okay. So again, um, usually these lipid barriers, these are going to be the, the cell membranes typically are going to be the biggest uh, barrier to absorption here. And you can find that by changing the pH of the uh, medium that the drug is, is um, uh, dissolved in, you can affect how lipophilic or lipophobic the drug happens to be. We'll talk about how that happens in a little bit. But basically what you're going to find is that um, pH is going to dictate whether a drug is going to be in a charged or an uncharged state. Okay. So typically when you put a charge on a drug, think about like sodium. Remember sodium? Like sodium is in a permanently charged state when it's in solution. Does that cross those uh, lipid membranes very easily? Not really, not on its own, right? Um, because that charge kind of makes it bounce right off those lipid membranes. Because again, it's very polar when you have that charge on there. So what you find is that charged drugs, when they have a charge on them, they typically do not, they're going to bounce right off that lipid membrane typically. The uncharged state, however, is going to be able to cross very easily. Because when you put a, uh, you take away that charge, you're going to make it more lipid soluble. It's going to be able to cross less polar in that, in that case there, right? So to determine how well a, uh, or whether or not a drug is going to be charged or not, you have to know the pH of the solution you're in. You also have to know the pKa of the drug. And I'll go over what these are in just a minute and I'll show you some, some examples here in a little bit. But basically, we're using the Henderson-Hasselbalch equation to explain what this is. And it's going to tell us how well weak acids and weak bases are going to get absorbed based on the pH of the solution. Do you ever use drugs that have these active transport in the cell? Uh, yes, we, uh, drugs get actively transported all the time. Um, I'm trying to think of any good examples. Uh, usually what you'll end up finding and uh, more clinically relevant that comes up are going to be kind of efflux pumps. Usually you're going to find drugs will have, especially like the blood brain barrier, it likes to keep stuff out essentially. Um, you'll find a lot of efflux pumps actually pump drugs out of the, the CNS in order to kind of help protect the brain essentially. So I see a lot of those. Um, I can't think of any examples specific right now uh, for things that use active transport, but they're, they're plenty. Uh, you don't see that clinically. That's not usually going to be uh, a relevant concern. The amount of energy it's actually requiring in the grand scheme of things is, is minuscule compared to just keeping your body operating, essentially. But good, good question. Yeah. Um, so what we're going to find is, again, charged drugs typically are going to be more lipid insoluble. So they're going to be lipophobic, but they're going to be hydrophilic, right? They're going to be water soluble. You're going to find uncharged drugs are going to be lipid soluble. So they're going to be lipophilic. However, they're going to be water insoluble. They're going to be hydrophobic, right? Okay. Um, so anyway, so we're going to look at the Henderson-Hasselbalch equation. We're going to look at how we can determine how well the drug gets absorbed, essentially. Okay. So pKa, this is what we're going to uh, be calling the acid dissociation constant. And so what you're going to find is, is that if a drug, and every drug, whether it's a weak acid, weak base, all has a pKa, right? So it's been scientifically determined by the people who are developing the drug. And basically what you're going to find is that when you put a drug in a pH solution that is identical to its pKa, you're going to find that you have basically 50% of the drug is going to be in a charged state. 50% is going to be in an uncharged state. Okay, it means 50% of it's going to be more lipophilic. 50% of it's going to be more hydrophilic. Okay. Usually, what our goal is when we're trying to absorb a drug is get it into a state where it's much less charged. We want to get it into a state where it's very lipophilic because that's going to increase the absorption of the drug. Okay. The way we're going to um, uh, denote these as we're looking, you're going to find that for a weak acid. When it has an extra proton in here, this is the uncharged state. So again, it gets an extra hydrogen ion on there. This is going to be the uncharged state. Okay. If it's missing the hydrogen ion, you're going to find this is going to be A minus, and so that's going to be the unprotonated acid. This is the charged form of it. Okay. On the flip side of that, if you're looking at uh, weak bases, you're going to find that BH plus is going to be the protonated base form. This is going to be charged, which means is it going to be very lipophilic? No, because again, it has a charge on it, so it's going to bounce right off that membrane. Versus this, just a B by itself is going to be the unprotonated base. It's going to be uncharged. Okay. So again, I'll show you why uh, I say like dissolves like, and why you're going to find that typically you want to be able to put weak acids into acidic solutions. You're going to want to put weak bases into basic solutions. All that's going to help drugs to get absorbed better. So, looking at this, you can see um, uh, in the case of a weak acid. So think about something like aspirin, right? Another name for aspirin. Anyone know what you abbreviate aspirin to? What through ASA? Does anyone know why it's ASA? Acetyl salicylic acid. Man, you guys are smart. Um, yeah, so acetyl salicylic acid. So we know that aspirin is, it happens to be a weak acid. Okay, so imagine you have aspirin. If you put it into a state where it is going to be charged, 
you're going to find that if you take away that proton there, you're going to find that it's going to be in a case where it's going to just be bouncing off that lipid membrane. It does not get absorbed very, very well. On the flip side of that, if I put it into a solution where there's more protons around, and we get to have a more protonated form, you're going to find it's going to have uh, no charge on it. It's going to be able to be absorbed very easily, right? And so what kind of solution is going to have more of these protons floating around? These hydrogen ions. Acidic solutions, right? So you remember pH is, a, is trying to determine how much, uh, what concentration have of these hydrogen ions that are just floating around. So again, you're going to find that when I put a weak acid into a more acidic solution, there's more protons floating around. It's going to be more likely to pick up and interact with that acid and make it more likely to be absorbed. So what you find is that weak acids like aspirin tend to be absorbed better in, in a more acidic solution. For instance, like the stomach. So aspirin tends to have pretty good absorption from the stomach because the pH of the stomach is what? Like two, it's very, very low, right? So again, you find that uh, aspirin gets absorbed very easily from there. On the flip side of that, if you're looking at a weak base, you'd see that it, when a base has extra hydrogen ions around, it's going to be in that charged state. It's going to just bounce off that membrane. However, if I go ahead and put it into a state where you're losing a lot of those hydrogen ions, say a more basic solution, you're going to find that it's going to be uncharged and crosses very easily, okay? And what you can actually find is that depending on the pH of each side of this, either extracellular, intracellular, or between different body compartments, you can actually find you can trap drugs in a certain state. So for instance, if I had a drug, um, a weak base that was in a, a, a more basic solution, where it could be absorbed very easily, if I put it over and it crosses into a more acidic solution, guess what? Now it gets turned into the protonated form, and it gets trapped there. So if you ever hear like ion trapping, that's basically what we're talking about, how we can try to, um, drugs can get sequestered in certain uh, solutions. So for instance, if you're doing something like breast milk, right? Again, one of the big things you're always going to be worried about with uh, pregnant patients or patients who are lactating is how much drug is getting to the baby essentially, right? And so one of the things you worry about is, uh, you know, well, with weak bases, you tend to find that the uh, breast milk tends to be a little bit more acidic. You can actually trap drugs in there and the baby gets a bigger concentration than what you might expect just based on, on mom's systemic concentration. So that's one way that can actually become clinically relevant is when the pH of the solution differs between, um, uh, you know, from one side of the membrane to another. Does that make sense? Okay. Down just a second. So basically, and again, you're not going to have to calculate this yourself, but I'll show you some, some examples here. But basically, um, looking at the henderson hasselbalch equation, normally be uh, listed here as pH equals the pKa. And again, this is specific for the drug you're dealing with. Again, weak acids and bases have a pKa associated with it. There's also a pKb, but we don't deal with that. Uh, and then you're going to take the log logarithm of the non-protonated species over the protonated species, okay? So basically what that looks like for a weak acid is going to have the pH equals pKa plus the log of the unprotonated form of the acid over the protonated species, right? So again, this is where you're going to have the, the extra hydrogen ions floating around. This is where it's going to be uh, bound to it. And then for bases, it's just going to be the, the same uh, situation there, but notice how, how B here is going to be the, the non-charged state, and then you have BH plus here, okay? So what that means is that when you keep a drug at its uh, pKa, if you put it into a solution at the same pH as pKa, you notice there's an equilibrium. There's 50-50 uh, of the protonated and the unprotonated state. However, if I were to shift that, if I were to put it into a different uh, pH solution, you can find I can change how much of it's protonated versus unprotonated. So for instance, if I have a weak acid that I put into a more acidic solution, as those hydrogen ion concentrations build up, more of that acid becomes protonated and less of it is charged. That means it's going to be more lipophilic, has an easy time of being absorbed. Okay. On the flip side of that, if I were to put a weak base into a more basic solution, you're going to find more of that's going to be in the unprotonated state, and it's going to be in a state where it can be more lipophilic and be easily absorbed. So again, like dissolves like, weak bases in a basic solution get absorbed very easily. Weak acids in an acidic solution get absorbed very easily as well. Okay. Everyone with me so far? I'll show you some clinical examples where this actually gets used um, with, with some regularity. Okay, so again, just another way of saying this, in an acidic solution, a weak acid is going to be in the protonated state, which means it's uncharged and very lipid soluble. Um, so again, with aspirin being uh, protonated, especially in the stomach, you tend to find this going to be much more lipid soluble, much more likely to be absorbed. On the other side of that, you have something, uh, a weak base, it gets protonated, it's going to be charged, and it's going to be lipid insoluble. Right, so more hydrogen ions floating around, interacting with a weak base, you're going to make it charged, less likely to be absorbed. Um, so for instance, morphine, if I were to give oral morphine, which we talked about being an opioid use for, for pain relief, um, you'd find in the stomach it'd be less lipid soluble because it's going to be in a, a charged state, it's protonated, it's charged, it cannot cross that membrane very easily. Okay. And again, every drug is going to have uh, its own individual pKa uh, associated with it. For some examples of weak acids, again, you don't have to memorize this list or these numbers. I just want to give you some examples. Like acetaminophen happens to be a, a weak acid technically, but it has a pretty high pKa versus something like aspirin. You know, so again, if I put aspirin into a solution that was 50% uh, or uh, at a pH of 3.5, it's going to be in a 50-50 sort of state. But if I put it into a solution that's 2, 
It's going to be much more in the protonated state. It's going to be much less uh, charged. It's going to be much easily, uh, much more easily absorbed in the stomach. Um, some examples, things like morphine, a weak basis. Cocaine itself is actually a, a weak base. Uh, ephedrine. Does anyone know that we use cocaine still medicinally? Technically, we do. Sometimes we use it for ENT surgery. We'll talk about why that is uh, in Farm 1. But just know that cocaine is actually a medicinal product. We used to carry it at the Children's Hospital. We're opening up. We asked our ENT docs, do you need cocaine? And they're like, yes, we're going to use cocaine. And they never used it. They're not just you know, expiring, so we got rid of our cocaine. But for a time, we did have it at the hospital. How we get rid of it? You don't want to know. <laughs> don't worry about it. Yes, ma'am. So if you were to take aspirin with, like, something that reduces your stomach acid, then, like, like an anti-type drug, then would that then decrease the absorption? You just described a drug interaction. Absolutely. Yeah, so that's a very good point there, uh, which I was going to make eventually. But you segued me uh, early. Um, yeah, so if I, you change the pH of the stomach, you can actually affect how well certain drugs get absorbed or not. So, for instance, if I were to, say, take something that increases the pH of the stomach, so say, for instance, like an antacid, right? Anyone know any examples of antacids? Tums. Yeah, Tums, right? Tums is calcium carbonate. It's able to neutralize stomach acids. You'd actually find that aspirin gets less absorbed because now the pH is being uh, is rising in the stomach. It's less, you know, be higher than two. And you're going to find that it's going to be in a more of a charged state. It's less likely to be absorbed. That is a very important uh, uh, sort of either food-drug interaction or drug-drug interaction um, that can affect how well drugs get absorbed uh, pretty significantly. And you can find that um, it's a key component to try to evaluate for your patients. Like, ask them what their diet is. Ask them what um, sort of um, other medications they might be taking, especially like Tums. Where do you get Tums at? Over the counter, right? So people can be taking Tums, and if you don't ask them if they're taking over the counter medications, you never find out about it. So, again, uh, medication history is super, super important to, to take for all your patients. Yes, sir? Just to understand, if I don't aspirin and PKF less than 3.5, it's just deprotonate or protonate? <clears throat> If you put it into a more acidic solution, so say you put it into a solution of two, pH of two, it should be, there's more hydrogen ions floating around there. So it should go into the more protonated state. And it's going to be, since it's a weak acid, it's going to be more easily absorbed, right? It's going to be less charged. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. So other medications can potentially uh, change the uh, pH of the absorbent. Absolutely. This, that is a, a super, super important um, drug drug interaction or drug food interaction. So, um, just to give you an example of that, um, calcium loves to bind up drugs for whatever reason. So, calcium um, tends to bind up a lot of drugs. And so, that's important because with older patients, you know, you're worried about their bones. What do you tell them to drink? A lot of calcium, a lot, a lot of milk, right? So, again, what you find is that patients are, and especially one, uh, one group of antibiotics called the fluoroquinolones. Anyone ever heard of like Cipro or Leviquin? They fall into that category there. They bind up with uh, with calcium very, very easily. So say, for instance, you have a patient coming in, they're complaining of pneumonia. Say, okay, I'm going to go ahead and give you a, a round of Cipro, right? So um, you give them some Cipro. They're going home. They're taking it with their milk. Well, all of a sudden, they come back, and their infection's not gotten any better. And I'm like, well, have you taken the entire round? They said, yeah, I took, took all of it. Took all seven days worth, 10 days worth of it. Um, the question you have to ask yourself, okay, well, did it, the drug not work? Did it actually get absorbed in the first place? Or could it be that it never got absorbed at all and it still it just got eliminated in the feces to bind to calcium? That's an important um, question you have to ask in order to determine, like, okay, was the drug just not working or just never get to the site where it needed to work in the first place? So, yeah, drug-food interactions, drug-drug interactions are huge, definitely, especially in older patients. Um, uh, we have to kind of assess, you know, how are they eating? Are they eating? What is, kind of stuff are they eating? Yep, definitely. Any other questions? Okay. Again, I love all these questions. These are great. Okay, so uh, to aid with permeation, sometimes you have special carriers. Um, so again, these can exist for either specific substances or you may find have more kind of general um, use depending on what type of uh, transport you're looking at. Um, so for instance, you have things like amino acid carriers. They're located within the blood-brain barrier. They kind of prevent things from getting across into the CNS. Um, sometimes you'll have things like weak acid carriers in the renal tubules. We're going to find in physio when we get to the renal section that um, absorption and secretion of substance in the kidneys is very, very important. And there's all kinds of transporters there that are available to help with that. Um, in some cases, you may find that molecules can be too large to actually passively cross the membrane on its own. In those cases, you need to have a, uh, some sort of transporter to help get it across. Right? So you have specialized transporters that can help to do that. Um, these tend to be not governed by fixed law. right? So again, these are examples of uh, usually facilitated diffusion or sometimes they're active transport. Um, but you're going to find that these are not going to be governed by fixed law because, again, they're not just kind of passively crossing those membranes. That means that they, the transporters can become saturated. When I say saturated, what does that mean? Uh, 
they're all full, right? So again, there's no more extra uh, transport. Even if I increase the dose of the drug on the outside of the membrane, there's no more uh, there's more transporters to move it across, right? So again, it's going to be slowed down because all the transports are saturated. In a lot of cases, it uh, tends to require energy, especially if you're dealing with active transporters um, that require ATP. And again, in some cases, it may go against that con uh, concentration gradient, especially like in the blood brain barrier when trying to pump things out of the CNS. Usually, it's against the concentration gradient, and that would require energy at that point in, in the form of ATP. Okay, just know that again, it can be saturated and tends to be um, uh, going against the concentration gradient. Um, I said one interesting case where um, anyone familiar with the drug Imodium, a little paramide, what do you use it for? They use it for diarrhea. It usually slows down the GI tract. What's interesting is that, or you guys may not find it interesting, I find it interesting, uh, is the fact that Imodium or loperamide actually works on the opioid receptors uh, peripherally. It's unable to actually cross the blood brain barrier. If it does cross, it actually gets spit out by one of these transport proteins right, normally. So even though I take a ton of loperamide, I normally don't get a high from it like I would from like a morphine because it never gets into the brain to work where, where it would, right? But it works on those opioid receptors in the GI tract and slows everything down. Similar to if you have patients who are on opioids chronically, constipation is the number one side effect they're probably going to complain about, right? So anyway, so we had this one patient who, um, I, I don't know if she just was a, a very uh, intuitive sort of uh, pharmacologist or she just read it up online somewhere, um, but she's, you know, because loperamide, you can get over the counter, it's no problem. It's not a controlled substance. You don't have to have a prescription. It's easy to get, right? You can go to Costco and buy a ton of it. Um, and so she was able to find out that, okay, well, wait a second. If I take this stuff, but I take it with something that actually inhibits one of these proteins, this transporter, all that uh, little paramount can then cross into the blood-brain barrier. It can't get pumped out. And all of a sudden, I have this high. And so there's a drug, and I'll tell you, never ever use this drug. It's called cimetidine. It's a uh, H2 blocker. You sometimes use it for, for acid reflux, essentially. Um, and, and basically, it's over the counter. You can get it. Uh, Tagamet is usually the, the brand name we're going to see it under. Um, but basically, it inhibits that protein. So we had this lady who said, okay, well, I'm going to go ahead and get a really nice high off of this. I'm going to take all this little paramide, and I'm going to take all of this Tagamet, uh, this cimetidine at the same time. And so I, she inhibited those proteins, and all of that little paramide got across the CNS. Well, she ended up having a lot of other problems as well because she took so much of it. She ended up going into like V-fib, um, nearly died. Somehow we got her back. I mean, it was it was it was a pretty nasty overdose because again, uh, drugs don't work the same when you have like really high concentrations of them. Like she was taking, I think she took like you know ten or twenty boxes of, of loperamide. It was, it was a crazy amount. I don't know how her high was. She didn't really remember much of it, but. <laughs> Yeah, so again, don't do drugs. Uh, they're, they're bad, but uh, that is one way you can actually, you know, sometimes uh, kind of monkey with the system in order to get a, a desired effect. But anyway. Okay, so uh, an example of that protein that she was messing with is, is this MDR transporter, where basically it's an efflux pump that requires energy to pump things out against the concentration gradient. So she was actually using uh, the some editing to inhibit this, and we're able to get a very high concentration of the CNS. You also have this within the GI tract. Um, so basically, I can absorb a drug through the GI tract and then kind of uh, within those cells spit it back out into the GI tract again with this efflux transporter. So has anyone ever heard of like you know not drinking grapefruit juice with your with your drugs? Now, some of you should recommend to uh, older patients who are taking drugs that are substrates of this protein. So an example is a set of drugs called statins. Anyone familiar with statins? What you use them for? Yeah, so statins used for cholesterol. So if you ever hear like Lipitor or uh, Zocor, uh, if you hear a statin at the end of the name of a drug, it usually means it's used for high cholesterol. And so basically what we're having uh, is that some patients were, you know, again, older patients, typically their taste buds tend to diminish over time. And so they like things like really kind of strong sort of flavors in order to kind of excite those taste buds, uh, as we'll see in physio uh, next time. Um, but basically you're going to find that they, they like grapefruit juice for whatever reason. I think stuff's disgusting, but they love it. So they're, they're drinking it. <laughs> Have high cholesterol, they're, they're drinking, they're inhibiting these pumps, and all of a sudden the concentration. So, again, normally this is pumping drugs out of the system. If I inhibit that, what happens to the concentrations within the system? They're going to go up, right? So, again, you found that patients were developing hepatotoxicity, so they're having liver damage due to these high concentrations of statins, and they also develop what they call rhabdomyolysis. Anyone know what that is? Yeah, muscle breakdown essentially, right? So they uh, were, you know, developing this like really kind of coffee-looking sort of urine, or uh, uh, you know, iced tea sort of looking urine, very very dark because all that myoglobin breaking down, and it was related back to them drinking grapefruit juice and having such high concentration of these drugs. Okay, so again, just one example of a drug-food interaction you have to be really cognizant of when you're prescribing uh, drugs to your patients. Okay, um, some other transporters, you, again, you can find these everywhere, but uh, some of these are useful for uh, spitting drugs out into, say, the biliary tract, where then I can eliminate them out into the GI tract and they can go into the feces. That's one way you can do things. Um, you're going to find these within um, uh, other places, you know, within the renal tubules. You can find these in the enterocytes all over the body. Um, these are also going to be uh, transporters that can be useful in uptaking neurotransmitters uh, across nerve ending membranes, right? So that's another thing you may find. And this will be important when we talk about psych meds later on, like depression and, and, and bipolar disorder 
and all those different things later on. So again, these are these transport proteins are everywhere, and if you inhibit these or induce them, you can have pretty significant drug interactions. Okay. So um, sometimes you'll have certain drugs be absorbed through endocytosis. We know it, what is endocytosis? Kind of like a big cellular hug, right? So it kind of brings it into the fold, essentially. Um, these are usually good for very large molecules or things that tend to be lipid insoluble or they're un otherwise unable to get into the cell, right? And again, this is typically going to be on a much more kind of specific basis. This is not uh, a very common way we talk about drug absorption, but is, is one to note. Um, and so things like B12, uh, getting absorbed with intrinsic factors, one example. Because um, again, B12 is important for what? Uh, DNA uh, it can be useful for that. What else, though? Yeah, B12 deficiencies can develop. Anemias, yeah. So again, if you have a patient with B12 deficient, you develop some anemias. So you need to have that B12 around. Um, again, iron uh, with transferrin, that's another way to get iron absorbed into the body is with uh, endocytosis, right? Those are the big things there. Okay, exocytosis, this is good for uh, releasing things out of the cell into the bloodstream. So for example, um, calcium, uh, for releasing enzymes from the pancreatic cells, because we know uh, the pancreas has some exocrine functions to help digest food and things like that. Uh, and a lot of hormones get uh, released via exocytosis. That's one way to get products out and into the bloodstream, essentially. Again, we've covered this already, so you're familiar with endo and exocytosis. Okay, so that's it for absorption. Those are the main concepts here. And again, we'll talk about it more on a specific basis, especially when we get into specific uh, dosage forms. All right, next up is distribution. When I say distribution, what does that mean? Where does the drug go when it's in the body, right? So again, just like you distribute packages from Amazon from a central hub into everyone's home, right? Um, you have to distribute drugs from the central circulation once it's absorbed out, out to the body, right? And so different things are going to uh, determine how diffuse or how distributed drugs uh, end up in the tissue. So the big concept here is going to be what we call volume of distribution, or VD, not Panero disease, but the volume of distribution. Um, and this, so this is going to be the apparent volume a drug would have to occupy to give the same serum concentration measured within the body. Let me explain that a little bit uh, more detail, but this is kind of the baseline. That's what the definition technically is. It's kind of a theoretical number, but it allows us to try to determine after I give a drug, say, for instance, I give a drug uh, IV. Remember that term bioavailability? What that meant? What does that mean? Basically, what percentage of the drug that I'm administering actually makes it into the into the systemic circulation, right? And you want to say systemic circulation just means the blood supply, essentially, right? So I guess in the IV has what kind of bioavailability? 100% directed uh, injected it right into the veins, right? So again, say assume I have 100% bioavailability, um, I'm going to be able to determine how well that drug is going to distribute from the, the the bloodstream out into the tissues there, right? Some drugs do not partition out very much. Some drugs partition out quite a bit, and so we'll talk about different, um, um, you know, drugs and kind of some different examples of that and how that is used clinically. Um, and so again, uh, high volume distribution is typically going to mean you have a high distribution out to the tissues. Low volume distributions mean you're going to have a low amount. A lot of it stays within the bloodstream. Okay. And again, when I'm measuring, uh, when I'm le measuring levels of drugs in the body, how am I usually doing that? Usually with a serum sample, usually getting blood, taking blood from the patient, and then measuring how much drug is there. That's usually going to be telling us. And again, knowing uh, how well a drug gets distributed, I can then use that as a surrogate to determine what concentration I have of the drug out in the tissues. Okay, this is why volume distribution is very. So uh, one con or one uh, calculation that I'd like you to at least um, keep the variables in mind and know the relationship between is basically going to be um, this one right here. So it's going to be volume of distribution equals the drug concentration divided by the initial or the concentration of drug within the plasma, right? So again, the total drug I'm giving, the dose or D, divided by the C0, which is going to be the concentration of drug in the plasma, right? So again, understanding this relationship is very important to understanding how volume distribution works, okay? So for instance, if I give a drug um, and let's say, you know, I give a dose of a drug, so I'm giving 25 milligrams, and then I measure the plasma concentration after I administer it and I measure out five milligrams per liter, I can then figure out how far distributed out the drug actually got within the body. And so by doing this, uh, this calculation, I do 25 divided by five, and I know basically five liters is what that would be. Basically it's telling me, and I can then compare different drugs together to determine kind of what their uh, kind of... Uh, you know, difference in volume distributions happen to be. And I'll show you some more uh, examples specifically here in a minute. Usually, and this is kind of a good rule of thumb, is that the higher the volume of distribution is, the more lipophilic the drug is, and the more likely it is to be distributed very extensively out into the tissue, okay? Something with low volume of distribution tend to be more hydrophilic, which means it likes to stay within the systemic circulation and hang out there. It does not like to partition out the tissues very well, okay? So a good example of this. So um, I'm sure most people have probably taken a urine drug screen at some point in their life, right? Um, and one of the things they measure is THC. THC is found in what? Okay, so I'm going to answer that a little too quickly, but I'm just kidding. Um, 
Right, so THC is the actual component found in marijuana. And when you do your urine, urine drug screen, one of the things they test you for is, uh, is for THC, right? Now the question is, well, how long after someone smokes marijuana do they stay positive for THC? I'm sure lots of people have heard varying numbers out there. Anyone know how long? Okay, yeah, so again, the, the right answer, it depends, like all things in medicine, but some people like 90 days, some people is going to be, you know, uh, a week. It all depends because what you find is that THC is very, very lipophilic, which is why it's usually used in a lot of like baking goods and things like that. Usually you find like, you know, uh, pot brownies and things like that because it's very lipophilic, it likes to partition like into butter and oils and things like that. Not from personal use, I just see this a lot in, in <laughs> states where it's been legalized and you have a lot of edible products that are out there, which edibles are a problem in and of itself. But um, what you find is that it is very lipophilic, so it loves being out in the tissues, again, especially in the adipose tissue. So the question of how long someone stays positive for THC depends on the chronicity of use or how long they're using it for. Because again, if I'm constantly administering more and more drug to the system, the more and more it's likely to build up in that tissue. It also depends on how much adipose tissue someone has. So again, someone who's fairly, um, fairly thin and has not a lot of adipose tissue, they tend to not have as many stores uh, for the THC to go hang out in, right? So they just have less of the adipose tissue for to, to partition into. Someone has a, a lot higher body fat percentage tends to have more fat for the, the THC to go into. And so again, as long as it's out in the tissue, then it's there to be able to leak back into the bloodstream and then you can then eliminate through the urine and measure that. So again, some people will say, you know, as a toxicologist, I get the question more regularly than you might think. They say, well, how long am I going to be positive on this urine drug stream? I'm like, I can't tell you that good answer to that. Because again, it depends on so many factors, how long you're using, what dose you're using, how much adipose tissue you have, all those sorts of things can make it. So that some people may stay positive for 90 days after their last use. Some people, if they only use it once and they're fairly thin, maybe only a couple of days, right? So again, just an example of how volume distribution can affect, you know, uh, someone clinically, essentially, right? By whether or not they pass that urine drug screen. Don't do marijuana, by the way, while you're in PA school. It's just not a good idea. So you can't study very well. Anyway, <laughs> I love the one guy in the Olympics that was like banned, uh, or he got his like, uh, medal taken away for using marijuana. It says a performance enhancing uh, drug. And I was like, I, I don't see that. Like... <laughs> Like cocaine, okay, and amphetamine, sure, but like marijuana, like, I don't know about that. Anywho, um, but yeah, so high volume distribution, THC in this case would have a very high volume distribution, loves being out in the tissues, very, very lipophilic. Okay, and so I kind of use uh, the idea of, of kind of water tanks. So again, this is like an apparent volume. How much uh, volume would I have to actually uh, dissolve this drug into to get the same concentration that I would actually measure in the patient's blood, essentially, right? So imagine I have two different drugs here. I have one, uh, drug A, it's hydrophilic. And drug B is lipophilic. So just based on that, which one do you think has a higher volume of distribution? Drug B, right? Because it's lipophilic, right? It's going to be able to cross those membranes with relative ease compared to drug A. So again, drug B likes to be in the tissue. Drug A, being hydrophilic, likes to be in the, in the blood, right? likes to be in that systemic circulation. So imagine I give 50 milligrams of each drug to, or of the drug to two identical twins, right? So the identical twins should be the same weight, should have basically the same adipose tissue and all, all that good stuff. So it should be identical uh, to one another. And imagine I give one of them drug A and I give one of them drug B. And then I measure the amount of drug within the serum. I measure that concentration there. So what you would see is that looking at that concentrate or looking at the, um, the volume distribution, how I can calculate that. If I say, for instance, I were to measure, I uh, get 50 milligrams of drug A to this patient. And then the concentration I got was 10 milligrams per liter. That would mean I would have a basic volume distribution of five liters, right? Not a ton of volume, right? Because again, what the blood, what the blood volume is like what? It's like three, like three or four liters. Like it's, it's not a lot, much, much more than what that is right there, right? Um, versus drug B, if I were to measure that uh, concentration within the patient, it comes back at 0.5. Okay, well, I gave the same 50 milligrams of drug, but the question is like, where's the drug at? It's obviously not in the blood anymore. That's because it partitioned out to the tissue. So I do the constant, or I do the calculation. VD equals 50 milligrams of drug divided by the concentration that I measured. So 50 divided by 0.5 comes out to be 100 liters. Right, so again, I would have to put 50 milligrams of that drug into 100 liters of water to get that same concentration as what I measured in that patient's blood. Okay, so you would say that the volume distribution is much higher for drug B uh, in that patient because it has much more of the tissue it's like partitioning into. Yes, ma'am. Yes, so imagine, um, here's a good example. Uh, so there's uh, some antibiotics, uh, they're called the aminoglycosides. Okay, so these are going to, you're going to become very familiar with these when you get into, into farm one. Um, but things like gentamicin, tobramycin, there's one called amicacin, right? So we use these very frequently in the hospital to treat really nasty gram-negative infections, okay? So uh, they're very hydrophilic, though. They like they have a very low volume distribution. They like to hang out within the, the, the bloodstream, right? And so they also have a narrow therapeutic index. So these are one of those things that you can see um, uh, renal toxicity. You can see ototoxicity, uh, all kinds of problems if the drug levels are not kept in, in check, right? So these are drugs we're usually measuring a lot of serum levels on. So uh, being hydrophilic, 
you think it would have a pretty low volume distribution based on that, right? So, and, um, but the question is like, well, what happens if the patient's volume distribution changes? How could that occur? And so we see this very frequently. Imagine you have someone who has, uh, say, renal failure. They come into the hospital, they have really nasty gram-negative infections, they develop sepsis, and now they have renal failure, right? So again, the, re the kidneys are not working. So what do you think that does to the, the body water for the patient? The higher or lower? should be higher because their kidneys aren't getting rid of fluids and now they're holding on to it. So now I'm having this buildup of fluid within the extracellular space and the interstitial fluid, all that's starting to, to be, uh, build up. Now the question is, well, now there's all this extra water, where does that drug go to? It's hydrophilic, so it likes to be in that water too. So now that I actually have increased the volume distribution for that drug because now it has more volume for it to partition into, the blood levels should go down because again, less of it's in the bloodstream, okay? On the flip side of that, if I had someone who's very dehydrated, so on a very low body water levels, you didn't find that volume distribution would actually shrink. It actually get lower because, again, most of it's all going to be really concentrated right there in the bloodstream. Does that make sense? So based on that, um, you know, we have to change the dose of the drug we're going to administer because if it's either increased or decreased, we have to monitor that and make sure that the levels stay within check so that we kill the bacteria, but we don't hurt the patient's own healthy, you know, kidney cells or, or uh, hair cells in the ear, things like that. Does that make sense? So just one example I deal with pretty frequently. Um, you know, we do a lot of pharmacokinetic monitoring for the immunoglycosides in the hospital. Uh, every hospital does that, and, and um, you know, you can really harm a patient. And the big thing, the reason why it's so important um, from the hospital standpoint is, you know, when a patient comes in, they have insurance, say they have pneumonia, right? The insurance company is going to pay you to treat a pneumonia. If they develop kidney injury because you didn't watch the levels of their drug, do you think they're going to pay for that? Nope, it's a huge hospital cost. So again, hospitals are always trying to make sure they're not causing more harm to the patient because they don't get reimbursed for that sort of thing. Okay, that's why re, uh, rehospitalization rates are really important to watch because again, if you get rehospitalized too soon after discharge, you also don't get paid for that either. Right, so that's a big deal uh, from the hospital standpoint. Right. Obviously, you don't want to harm your patients either, but I'm just saying from like an administrative standpoint, that's what you're kind of looking for. It's all about money in the end. Anywho, so just to give you an example, usually you're going to find that uh, most drugs get their volume distribution expressed as in so many liters per kilogram. And then when you have a patient, if they're 100 kilograms, you just multiply that out to figure out what their individual volume distribution is. Does that make sense? So again, most drugs may come out and say, hey, if it's 0.5 liters per kilogram and I have a patient who's 60 kilos, I can multiply that out and I know what their volume distribution is for that particular patient. So, and again, it can range pretty widely depending on the drug you're looking at. So for instance, something like insulin has a pretty low volume distribution, only 0 0.05 to 0 0.1 liters per kilogram, uh, which basically means that it likes to stay right there within the bloodstream typically, right? It doesn't partition far out into the tissues um, versus something like something where uh, methotrexate, we talked about that being used for uh, rheumatoid conditions or being used uh, for cancer um, as, you know, say one to two. So that does like to get further out into the tissue, right? And then you get th some things that are very, very um, lipophilic, things that have a very high volume distribution, like kind of an old school anti-malarial drug called chloroquine has like 200. So most drugs don't get up that high, but you can see pretty wide ranges uh, with that. Okay. And the general rule of thumb is if I say something has a low volume distribution, usually it's less than one liter per kilogram. If it has a high volume distribution, it's usually greater than one liter per kilogram. So you can kind of put, if you were to look at the mark here, you can kind of mark it between phenytoin and methotrexate and say all these drugs have a high volume distribution. All these drugs have a fairly low volume distribution. Okay. Another big thing where this becomes important is, uh, at least for my purposes, from a toxicology standpoint, in some cases, people take an overdose of their drug at very high levels. I want to get rid of it quicker. One way I can do that is called dialysis. Anyone heard of dialysis? Anyone know what that is? Can you describe it? Kind of, it's like, like a big artificial kidney, essentially, right? So I can hook up the patient's um, uh, to this machine, can filter out their blood, and take away waste products, and then put it back into the patient, right? So you a big artificial kidney, essentially. And um, so if I wanted to get rid of some of these drugs, uh, you're going to find that things have low volume distribution get pulled off super easy. So if I have someone who overdosed on lithium, for instance, say they were, they're bipolar and they overdose on their lithium and they are now having seizures due to this, I can put them on dialysis because of low volume distribution and pull that off, right? That point's not important for you to remember right now, but just know that this has many clinical impacts depending on the type of drug you're dealing with, um, looking at drug monitoring, you're doing levels of these drugs, different things like that. So this becomes very, very important in a lot of circumstances. Make sense so far? I know this is kind of like weird to talk about this stuff conceptually, and this will become much more concrete when we get into Farm 1 and Farm 2, when we're actually learning about the drugs and actually getting into the, the nitty-gritty of like how to actually use these um, clinically in your patients. So again, know this stuff conceptually now. We'll put this into practice very quickly uh, in Farm 1 and in Farm 2. Okay, so another good example, um, let's say we want to estimate what someone's plasma concentration of a drug would be. So imagine I have a 70 kilogram uh, male patient, and I were to give them a drug that, uh, say 100 milligrams of this drug, uh, and the volume distribution is 0.6 liters per kilogram. Okay, so 
I can estimate what his plasma concentration is going to be. So I can say, okay, well, uh, what's the volume distribution for this drug for this particular patient? So the first thing I'm going to do is take the volume distribution and multiply by that patient's weight. All right, so I'm going to take 0.6 liters per kilogram and multiply it by 70, and that's going to give me what that patient's individual volume distribution is. Okay. So going back to this equation, I can look at VD equals dose over C0. And now I know all the variables except for one. I know everything except for that concentration. And this is what I'm trying to solve for. So again, all the algebra you learned at some point in your life it does come back every once in a while. I'm not going to do any calculus on you, but at least basic algebra will, will come up. Um, so again, I'm going to multiply 70 kilograms by that 0.6. I should get 42 liters. So I know that for that patient, for that drug, his volume distribution is 42 liters. Okay, That's going to equal 100 milligrams of the dose I gave divided by the C0. So this is what I'm trying to uh, estimate. And so I can then rearrange the, the equation. So now I'm solving for C0, which equals 100 milligrams divided by 42. Otherwise, it would be 2.38 milligrams per liter. Okay. So again, this is a theoretical exercise, but I can do this. So I can say, well, what dose would be appropriate for this patient? Now, for instance, if the, the say the reference range, the dose I'm trying to hit was say five milligrams per liter, I would then know that my dose is inadequate. Maybe I have to give 150 milligrams, maybe I have to give 200 milligrams. And by estimating that, I can already go ahead and kind of proactively decide what's gonna be the right dose for that patient, right? Because it'd be nice if I give everyone, okay, everyone gets 400 milligrams of ibuprofen, right? But that doesn't work for every single patient. You have to make things individualized in some cases. And this is one way we can uh, do that, right? And again, we'll get into more details on these, especially when we get into specific examples uh, as, as they become uh, relevant. Uh, moving on to metabolism. So again, this is how we're actually breaking down drugs and getting them ready for elimination. There. Um, and so basically, uh, usually you're going to find that um, the main goal here is we want to make things more water soluble for the majority of things. The reason why we like to make them more water soluble is because they can be eliminated in what sort of fashion? in the urine, right? So again, urine is mostly made up of water. So if things are more water soluble, they're gonna be able to be eliminated more quickly through there, right? So that's the main goal of most of our metabolism. Now, um, in some cases you may find that you'll actually have active byproducts, but in general, what you find is that with metabolism, you're gonna be making products or uh, breaking down drugs into less pharmacologically active products. So again, you're taking something that's active and making it inactive. Okay, that's the general rule of thumb, kind of what's going on. And again, there's some uh, exceptions to that, but we'll talk about them as they become relevant. But mainly, the goal is to make it more water-soluble, so it can be filtered by the glomerulus in the kidney and then eliminated in the urine. Now, I mentioned, uh, did I talk about prodrugs, what that was? You know what a prodrug is? Or it's not an amateur drug? I, I remember the jokes. I know I've at least talked to you about it. Um, but again, a prodrug is one that's inactive, right? It's one that has no activity on its own, but it has to be uh, enzymatically converted into the active product, right? So I mentioned that Vyvanse uh, drug that we use for ADHD. We, uh, they, uh, you know, when it's the list dexamphetamine, it's not active. But if I put it through the liver, it can metabolize it into the active product, which is dextroamphetamine. Uh, in the case of ACE inhibitor, anyone know what you use ACE inhibitors for? You hear about these used for blood pressure very frequently. So these are things like uh, Zestril or Ramipril or Altate. You know, there's lots of different ones that are out there, but they, they use for high blood pressure. And but they're inactive when you give the drug originally. So if I give something like Enalapril, the liver will metabolize to Enalapril. At, now it's active. Okay. Uh, codeine I mentioned is a good example. Or codeine itself is not a very good uh, analgesic. They're a very good opioid. However, the liver metabolizes it into morphine, which is a very good opioid. Right. So again. Um, and depending on people, their enzymes, some people may express a lot of this enzyme, some people may express a little bit of the enzyme, and that can change how well the drug's actually going to work, right? So again, I mentioned that example before, those kids were dying because they had a lot of that enzyme around, they made way too much morphine and had respiratory depression and died, right? Um, so again, these can have a lot of clinically relevant examples of how this will become important. Okay, so metabolism primarily occurs within the liver. However, it can also occur in other places, sometimes in the lungs, the GI tract, uh, the skin, kidneys in, in some limited circumstances. Um, but the main place we're going to see is the liver, and that's the main thing we're going to focus on here. Um, because the liver has a ton of enzymes available for it to uh, metabolize these drugs. And again, all the venous flow at some point is going to hit what? It's going to hit the liver, right? So before it goes back to the heart. Um, so uh, I have a lot of blood flow going that direction. And again, the goal here is to make it into a more water-soluble component, getting ready for excretion. So there's uh, two main types of reactions here. So we're going to talk about our phase one reactions and then our phase two reactions. Phase one is typically where we're going to try to uncover some sort of polar kind of functional group and can, in some cases, get it ready for a phase two reaction, right? So again, by making things more polar, they become more hydrophilic, right? So again, more water soluble. That's the main goal we're shooting for here. Uh, main class of reactions here we're going to see is going to be oxidation. This one's the most clinically relevant, which I'll talk about uh, in depth here. Uh, there's also things like reduction, hydrolysis. Just know the basic, we're trying to uncover some sort of functional group that makes the drug more water soluble typically. 
So uh, lots of different enzyme systems here. Um, the big one we're going to focus on is going to be cytochrome P450. Has anyone ever heard of CYP enzymes or CYP P450 enzymes? These are super, super important for drug interactions. I'm going to talk about why that is in a minute. Um, but you need to be really cognizant of these when you're prescribing drugs for your patient because if you screw this up and get the wrong uh, combination of drugs, you can find some very, very big toxicity and cost for your patients, right? It could be a frequent cause of hospitalization if you're not careful. Lots of problems can, can occur because of this. So this is the main enzyme system I'm going to talk about. But no, there's plenty of others that are out here as well, uh, especially like things like monoamine oxidase. This is really important for depression. Um, you know, things like esterase is important for certain enzymes in the bloodstream. But there's lots of them that are out there. So, and of course, I bolded it. That usually means it's probably going to be ripe for, you know, questioning on any kind of sort of examinations. Probably good to know, right? Um, now, phase two reactions are typically we're going to be adding on something to the molecule. Usually, you're going to be conjugating with something, either adding like a glutathione group or a glycine or something like that. Um, you also have things like sulfation, which would obviously add what? Probably a sulfate group, you know, glucuronidation. I added on a glucuronide group. So, again, all that is, again, getting it ready for excretion typically within the kidneys. So um, looking at metabolism, imagine here you have something um, like an enzyme coming along. Uh, and again, you have to memorize this is kind of more detailed than what we need, but just shows an example how a drug can come along um, and it can be uh, affected by things like the CYP P450 enzymes. Um, if you had this phase one metabolism. Now, uh, one thing that some students get confused, just because um, you know, some drugs can only go through a phase one reaction and then be eliminated. Just because it undergoes a phase one does not mean it goes phase two. It does not have to go through those steps and go phase one and then that's it. Or it can just go to phase two and then that's it. Or you can go to phase one and then to phase two. Those are typically the main ways it's going to go. Um, it does not have to be an all or none sort of phenomenon here, right? But again, the basic rule is, is you're going to find these drugs come along, undergo some sort of phase one metabolism where they may be excreted, or they go along into a phase two metabolism. We're going to add something onto it, the molecule, and then it can be excreted from there, okay? A uh, good example, and you can have, again, we talked about enzymatic pathways in, in physio a little bit, but this is another good example of how um, different drugs can undergo multiple enzymatic pathways in order for elimination. So you guys remember acetaminophen, uh, otherwise known as? Hyaluronic. Good. So this has several different enzymatic pathways that it goes through. Um, you guys remember if you take too much Tylenol, what organ takes a hit? The liver, right? So again, liver toxicity, think Tylenol. Um, so imagine you have, you have Tylenol here. This is the, the, the main molecule. Um, now, you can find that maybe two-thirds of it undergo this glucuronide conjugation. So you actually add a glucuronide group, and then that can be eliminated through the kidneys, right? That's one way. Some cases, you have maybe a third of it going through the sulfation pathway, and then that can be eliminated on its own, right? It's more water-soluble, can be eliminated through the kidneys, no problem. There's this other pathway, and this is actually through a phase one reaction. This is a CP452E1. You don't have to memorize that that, uh, that specific enzyme, but just know there's a P450 enzyme here that uh, works on this kind of accessory pathway. And what actually happens is if you take too much Tylenol, you end up exhausting these two pathways here. You run out of sulfate, you run out of glucuronide to conjugate there, and so you exhaust those. And that means you have a higher percentage going in and developing this uh, product called NAPQI, N-A-P-Q-I. This is actually what causes the liver damage you see with Tylenol. You may produce a little bit of it every time you take a dose of Tylenol, but normally you're going to find that you can usually metabolize it, usually through this glutathione conjugation here, and then eliminate it. It's not too, it's not really dangerous. However, if I have a lot of Tylenol around and I get rid of these pathways and now I'm only for pouring this, and this can be exhausted too, um, that's when it causes a lot of damage, right? So just know that drugs can undergo multiple pathways here. It just depends on the medication you're dealing with. You don't have to memorize any of these specific pathways here for Tylenol. We'll talk about that more in depth later on in a different class, but... Just to kind of get the concepts here. Just know that, okay, you know, things can undergo phase one and be eliminated. Sometimes they go phase one, phase two. Sometimes they just go phase two. It just all depends on the drug. Uh, and again, as a, as a practicing PA, do you think you're always going to memorize these pathways for your drugs that you're administering? No, but these do inform a lot of the drug interactions. So when you see, hey, why can't I get these two drugs together? Sometimes it has to do with these pathways here, right? So that's kind of the, the takeaway points I want you to kind of uh, take away from this. Okay, um, again, you don't have to memorize this table, but just know that here's some examples of different sort of uh, enzyme, enzyme systems that are here. No, again, phase one or typically you're uncovering a polar functional group. Usually in phase two, you're adding something onto the molecule. And those are two big differences between phase one and phase two. There are other ones that are out there. You have things like alcohol dehydrogenases, which are good for obviously ethanol and, and other products. Um, so there's lots of enzyme systems that are available out there. Okay, and I mentioned the first pass effect. Anyone remember what that is? Basically, it's like a liver tax, right? So imagine I take something orally and it gets absorbed from the GI tract. The first organ that's going to hit from there on is what? Going to be the liver, right? So everything goes through the liver when it gets absorbed from the GI tract, for the most part. Um, and so you're going to find that if the drug itself is subject to some of these enzymes, a portion of it may be metabolized. 
maybe a little bit of the drug or maybe all the drug in some cases and everything in between. And so basically this first pass effect will dictate how good of a bioavailability I actually get from that drug, which is why oral administration is so variable in, in regards to bioavailability. Some drugs cannot be absorbed orally, mainly because it's a first pass effect. Some drugs go through and they have no uh, issues whatsoever. They have 100% bioavailability because they don't have a first pass effect. All just depends on the drug you're dealing with, but mainly it's a, that process of some of the drug being metabolized uh, before it gets out into the systemic circulation. Okay, so again, it'll vary on the medication, um, and it can depend on, on the drug you're dealing with. So a good example um, where changing the route of administration can change the effects pretty drastically is an example for alcohol, right? So normally alcohol is absorbed via which route? Typically orally, right? So typically you take a drink of alcohol and, that's, and then you absorb it from the GI tract. Some of that gets metabolized by the liver, okay? However, are there any other routes you can use alcohol? Maybe not. Uh, maybe not. Not so smart ways of using alcohol. Anyone? Right. Okay. So rectal. That's a good one. When in the case when, when the heck would I use rectal alcohol? Rat party. Okay. Perfect. Yes. <laughs> good answer. Yeah. So um, they, what do they call that? They call that the butt chug. Butt chug. There you go. Thank you. <laughs> I want someone else to say it, not me. So. Um, yes, yeah, so with the butt chug, right? So basically, that is a, a rectal enema of alcohol. So the problem, so hold on, let me, let me bring it back into why this is relevant here. So the reason why that's important is because when you absorb things from the rectum, it's a very high vascular space, right? So again, it's very thin mucosa, absorbs things very well. Um, that bypasses the liver. You bypass that first pass effect. So now the bioavailability has increased significantly for that, that beer you just chugged, right? Rectally. Um, <laughs> The reason why that's a problem is, is because say, you know, you drink two beers and say, okay, you're, you may be a little buzzed, but you're fine. However, if I were to butt chug that same amount, <laughs> again, I do not recommend this or condone any such activities. <laughs> However, the bioavailability goes up significantly. And now that same two beers has now gotten the person to where they're uh, maybe near blackout levels, right? So again, uh, people do not understand how that, uh, again, there's again, a lot of frat parties, uh, you're not talking about the pharmacokinetics of the alcohol you're imbibing. Um, and so they don't take that into account as they have very high bioavailabilities and they get very, very drunk very fast and then you can have problems, right? You know, respiratory depression, you know, syncope, all that bad stuff. Um, there's other routes as well. So has anyone ever heard of, um, you know, high school students who are uh, uh, putting tampons in alcohol and absorb that intravaginally? Intravaginal space very similarly bypasses the first pass effect. Uh, has anyone seen like the, um, the vapor teenies? I saw that a couple of years ago. Basically, it's like a, um, something where you can put alcohol, use a hard liquors into this like glass ball, uh, and then you put like a tea candle underneath it, uh, and that would basically vaporize the alcohol, and then you would inhale that. The lungs are, again, for some drugs, very easily absorbed uh, through the lungs there. So again, lots of different ways, but the main thing to know is it bypasses the first pass effect. Okay, if I give something IV, is there a first pass effect? Nope, you bypass that completely. That's why it has 100% bioavailability. Okay, so again, first pass effect is very important. By changing the route, that can change your dose pretty significantly. So, for example, if I give something orally and I have to give 100 milligrams to get my effect, IV, I may only have to give 75 milligrams because I don't want to. I'm going to make sure I take into account that first pass effect, that liver tax. Okay. Please don't go home and tell your loved ones that you learned about new ways to do alcohol from your farm professor. Like, what kind of school are you going to? Okay. Um, so again, the cytochrome P450 system, I'll kind of probably end up finishing off with this. Um, this is the number one most important liver enzyme system you're going to deal with. These are uh, the majority of drug interactions you're going to run into um, come about from this system. Okay, so again, P450, good to know. Um, involved in a lot of uh, kind of endogenous biosynthesis and, and catabolism, so just, it's used normally in the body anyway, um, but it's responsible for metabolizing probably over 50% of drugs that are out there, right? Um, so a huge number of drugs get metabolized through the P450 system, and again, this is the main thing that gets in um, um, uh, involved in many drug interactions because you're going to find that different substances can either inhibit the system or can induce the system. This is why you're going to see so many drug interactions. We'll talk about how those uh, play a role in just a minute here. So there's over a thousand individual actual enzymes that have been uh, identified here. Um, we have more than 50 ourselves that are, are usually functional. And you're going to find that, you know, cytochrome P450 is kind of the big umbrella term for this system, but there's going to be actual individual enzymes within it that are going to be each clinically um, uh, relevant, you know, depending on the, uh, the system we're talking about. So uh, we call these multiple forms isoenzymes. I'll give uh, some examples here in a second. But basically, there's different genes that code for these different proteins, even though they have the same functionality, essentially. Um, but that way, you'll find that certain enzymes, certain P450 enzymes, will uh, metabolize this drug, but not this drug, and vice versa, right? So again, this is why they have some selectivity for different medications.
So uh, to give you an example how we name these drugs, so usually you're going to find that the, uh, say I'm dealing with a CYP2D6 enzyme. Okay, So CYP is going to be denoting that, yes, it's a cytochrome P450 enzyme. Okay, so it automatically notes a liver enzyme metabolizing uh, medications. Two refers to the family. So again, it all goes back to the, the amino acid sequence and how much homology it shares with other, uh, say, two enzymes within the CYP uh, family. Um, D is going to be the subfamily, and then 6 is the actual individual enzyme. This is the unique sequence to it. Um, so again, CYP2D6 would be the actual individual CYP enzyme. This becomes important because you'll find that um, some drug interactions will be through 2D6, some will be through 2E1, some are 3A4. There's lots of different CYP enzymes, and we'll learn some of the more relevant ones as we go forward, uh, especially in Pharma 1 and Pharma 2, we get to specific examples. So you don't have to memorize every single one of them, but as they become relevant, it's good to kind of key in. And I'll show you the one specific one we're going to talk about most frequently uh, in this class. So again, this is the mechanism, uh, an enzymatic process here, but just know basically you're going to be adding in the drug and eventually you're going to be getting uh, an oxidized process, an oxidation reaction you're getting out of this. And again, having the hydroxyl group, what does that do to water solubility? You typically increase it, right? Having an alcohol group on there is going to be increasing the, the water solubility, usually getting it ready for either uh, you know elimination through the kidneys or for that phase two reaction, we're adding something on. Um, again, you don't have to memorize this whole process here. Just know this is an oxidation pathway. And again, the most clinically relevant one we're going to talk about um, in this class. There's lots of ones that are out there. So again, this is just, uh, don't memorize this table, but just know that um, there's lots of ones that are out there that are available. Um, notice here, 3A4, this is the main one I'm gonna talk about um, most frequently because this is uh, responsible for the most number of varied drugs that's gonna be metabolizing compared to some of the other ones, right? And so this is the one that most frequently comes up for drug interactions. And the big thing to note here, there, you can have two influences on the enzymes. You can either induce them or you can inhibit them. And each of those are going to lead to different drug interactions and different um, you know, kind of clinical outcomes, as we'll talk about here in a second. But again, this goes back and shows you some examples of how um, even things you might not think about can actually affect your enzyme system. So, for instance, like um, charcoal rolled foods, you know, that's going to be important in uh, summertime. You're going to be out there barbecuing. That can actually affect your expression of some of these CYP enzymes, right? That can affect, can cause drug interactions potentially, right? Uh, so, again, uh, don't memorize this list. Just know that um, you know, there's lots of different enzymes that are out there. We'll talk about the relevant ones as they, as they come up. Okay, so this uh, uh, pie chart kind of shows you um, the different CYP enzymes and kind of their kind of proportion of drugs that they're responsible for metabolizing. You notice here CYP3A4 itself is like 50% of the drugs on, on, uh, that are out there get metabolized just through CYP3A4, right? So again, this is a very, very important one for drug interactions. This is one you want to be screening for when you're, ever, you're prescribing a new drug to your patient uh, to watch out for these. Um, obviously, some of the other big ones include things like CYP2D6. Um, you know, uh, 2C9 is going to be another big one, especially for um, certain anticoagulants we'll talk about later on. But uh, 3A4 is the big, this is kind of the, uh, the most important one clinically you're going to run into. Here's some of the second uh, phase two pathways as well. These, this is less important to know, um, but it's a little bit more uh, kind of even uh, split between the different um, um, reactions there. Okay. Um, Again, some drugs may be metabolized in non-liver areas, so like in the gastric acids. This can be a reason why some drugs actually do not get absorbed uh, at all when given orally is due to gastric acids breaking it down. That's why you can't give oral insulin. This is a protein. We have lots of uh, uh, protein de degrading enzymes in the GI tract, right? So again, that's why we don't give proteins orally. Um, you know, sometimes it could be due to those digestive <coughs> enzymes or just the uh, enzymes in the intestinal wall. Um, and in some cases, you may find that uh, the gut flora, when I say gut flora, what does that refer to? Just the bacteria <laughs> normally growing within the GI tract, they can actually be responsible for certain metabolism. So, for instance, if you disrupt the gut flora, this can affect how well you absorb vitamin K, right? So, that can be a problem if you're dealing with drugs that inhibit vitamin K, like warfarin we talked about before. Um, so, that can be responsible for some drug interactions. Um, this can also affect things like um, the uh, – one thing we'll talk about later on when we get into, um, uh, you know – women's health is talking about estrogens. Estrogens actually get eliminated through the biliary tract, through the, um, through the bile, and they actually get broken down uh, by the gut flora, and then you can reabsorb that estrogen. And so that's the reason why if you ever hear, like if you're ever taking um, oral contraceptives, and they tell you uh, if you're on antibiotics to take use backup method, that's usually because when you take antibiotics, you wipe out that gut flora, and then uh, you worry about absorbing the estrogen levels drop, and then you may ovulate. Again, don't memorize that, but just know we'll talk about that again later on. Uh, but gut flora can be very important for um, certain uh, drug metabolism. Um, so any questions before I let you guys go? That's all the time I have now. Uh, if not, I will see you guys tomorrow for another round of physio, I think, right? Yeah, that's right. yeah, our, that's our last physio before the test, right? All right. Don't seem so excited.